Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on uh, the question, why Christ died? We just finished celebrating Easter, which of course is a commemoration not only of the resurrection of Christ, but the atonement that it brings. And sure enough, as happens at every Easter, atheists come out of the woodwork and ask rhetorically, why is it that the Christian God would punish an utterly innocent man like Jesus in order to pull humanity's chestnuts out of the fire? Who would worship a God who would do something that evil, that atrocious? Well, it's a good question, uh, but in point of fact, Christians don't worship that kind of a God because that's not what the atonement is all about. The atonement isn't about punishment. It is about, to use a word that the 11th century monk Anselm of Canterbury uh, employed, satisfaction. Satisfaction is the key word for atonement, not punishment. Now today is actually the feast day of St. Anselm of Canterbury, so it seems to me to be particularly appropriate that we would invite him to help us better understand what atonement is and what atonement is not. Anselm was born in Italy uh, around 1033, and as a young man, he seems to have been a wandering scholar, moving from monastery to monastery to sit at the feet of various teachers. In his mid-twenties, he eventually wound up at the monastery of Beck in Normandy to study under a man whose reputation for wisdom uh, was quite profound, a man by the name of Lanfranc. Um, Anselm stayed at Beck for some years, eventually taking holy orders. Um, and when Lanfranc uh, relocated to Britain to become Archbishop of Canterbury, Anselm was named prior in his place and became the head teacher of the monastery. A few years after that, when Lanfranc died, Anselm was moved himself to Canterbury to become Archbishop, a post he neither wanted um, nor asked for. Um, he appears to have been quite uh, averse to administrative duties. He is a wonderful author, uh, the author of, of many books, all of them very rigorous, all of them very learned, but all of them, by the way, also very user-friendly. Anselm is a wonderful stylist, and you should have no trouble at all uh, picking up his stuff and, and reading it. Um, he wrote what he did in the conviction that faith is complemented by rational scrutiny, not threatened by it, but actually enriched by it. He adopted as his personal motto, in fact, uh, fides quarum intellectum, uh, faith seeking understanding, because it was his uh, conviction that our uh, faith is only strengthened by our attempts to understand from a rational, logical perspective the doctrines and tenets um, which uh, it holds. And in all of his books, he exemplifies that approach. Three books in particular stand out, uh, the Monologian, the Proslogian, and the Cors Deus Homo. Uh, the first two books, the Monologian and the Proslogian, are written kind of as textbooks, although extremely sophisticated textbooks, for his fellow monks. Um, and what they try to do is to offer arguments for the existence of God, uh, as well as arguments for divine attributes. And just in passing, I might add that in the Proslogian, we find what I take to be the single best argument for the existence of God going. It's known as the ontological argument. Uh, perhaps we can devote a future Holy Spirit moment to exploring it. In the third work that I just mentioned, Cur Deus Homo, um, sometimes translated as why God became man, but more literally translated as why the God-man, Anselm uh, analyzes the atonement and comes up with his model uh, of it, which is based upon satisfaction and not punishment. So, what does he have to say there? Well, he starts at the beginning. He looks at the creation of the universe. He says that God created the universe to be an orderly environment, one that was permeated with harmony and wholeness. Um, and he created human beings in a similar fashion, in his own image. And his intention for both the universe and for human beings was to um, dwell 
uh, in this wholeness and this harmony. And the eventual um, providential plan for human beings was for us to enjoy the beatitude of the angels, says Anselm. But all of that became broken when human beings sinned. When we sinned, we introduced a fracture or a breakage into an otherwise harmonious, whole uh, uh, nature. And moreover, when we sinned, we dishonored God because in sinning, we refused to conform our will to God's, a conformity which, after all, was in our best interest, but which we stubbornly rebuffed. And so we created an injustice on two levels. We committed an injustice against the orderly and harmonious universe by disrupting it, by breaking its integritas, its integrity, and we committed an injustice against God by dishonoring his honor. What's to be done? Uh, Anselm asks. Is there any way to fix this injustice that human beings have perpetrated upon the world and upon God? Well, people have offered three possibilities. One possibility is that God could just punish human beings. God could inflict upon us the very just consequences of our misbehavior. But if that's what happens, the injustice still remains. The universe is still fractured, and God is still dishonored. It's just that human beings are penalized for doing all of that. So the, penal, the penalty that we may suffer is richly deserved, but it does nothing to restore that which has been broken. Or the second possibility is that God could simply forgive human beings. Instead of punishing them, God could forgive them. God could wipe the slate of their own iniquity clean, but in point of fact, it really wouldn't be a wiping clean of the slate because the blemish of committing an evil would still be present within us, and there's no way that a soul which is blemished like that can ever enjoy beatitude. And moreover, the universe still remains fractured, just as it would remain fractured uh, if God punished us instead of forgave us. And God remains dishonored, just as God would remain dishonored if God punished us instead of forgiving us. So neither of those two options seem to be very viable, do they? What about the third option, satisfaction? Punishment is when the perpetrator of a sin has inflicted upon him or her the just consequences of his or her deed. But satisfaction is an act on the part of the perpetrator to voluntarily make right what it is that he or she broke. It's an act of restoration that is committed by the person guilty of um, fracturing wholeness to begin with. Would that be a way of fixing that which has been broken and of fixing the dishonor that was shown to God? Well, yes and no. Let's take the no part first. We look at the world around us, says Anselm, and we see that it's a mess. There are wars, there are pestilences, there are everyday petty acts of malice and cruelty that we perpetrate against one another. And this has been going on ever since human beings fell. It doesn't seem likely then that on our own steam we can restore the brokenness of the universe, the brokenness which our own sin has inflicted. That's the experiential argument that testifies to the no. There's another argument, though, that testifies to the no, and it's a moral argument. We simply don't have the wherewithal to wash away, to restore the honor of God, which we've blemished by our disobedience to God. And why is that? Well, look at the gravity of a sin is measured against the dignity of the person who is the sin's victim. Now, God, by definition, is infinite. And what that means is that the honor of God is likewise infinite. All of God's attributes are infinite. We human beings, however, on the contrary, are finite creatures. How could it ever be possible for a finite creature to make up for an infinite sin, which our dishonor of God is? It's impossible. 
We simply don't have the wherewithal to do that. Ah, but wait a minute, an objector to Ansel might say. What if we really ratcheted up our devotions, our worship, our prayer life, our good works? Wouldn't that somehow make up for what was broken? Well, no, says Anselm. First, once again, because they would be finite acts of a finite human, but also because that's what God expects of us anyway. That's what we were obliged to do even before we fell. That's just the standard operating procedure of a human being, which in no way is going to be enough to make up for this egregious injustice that our sin has brought about. Is there some way out of the fly bottle? Yes, there is, says Anselm. The perpetrator of the injustice has to be the one to offer satisfaction, to restore. But the perpetrator, humanity, doesn't have the juice to do that because humanity is finite and the sin is infinite. God does have the juice to do it because God is infinite and so can redress an infinite sin, but God isn't the perpetrator. So God can't offer satisfaction for the injustice committed against him or the injustice committed against the uh, universe. So in God's mercy, God incarnates, the second person incarnates in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, fully human and fully divine, gets us around this deadlock, gets us out of the fly bottle. As a human being, Jesus is exactly the kind of creature who can offer satisfaction on behalf of humanity. As fully God, however, at the same time as being fully human, Jesus has the ability to fix that which has been broken. Jesus voluntarily dies in order to bring about a restoration of that which has been broken. God isn't punishing an innocent man. God is, if you will, taking upon his own shoulders the injustice perpetrated by humanity, which caused the rupture between humanity and God and humanity and the created order, thus bringing about the restoration or the atonement, the atonement, between God and humans and between humans and the created order. That's what the atonement is all about. It's not about punishment. It's not about rigid legalisms. Somebody's got to pay for this. It really, when you think about it, is about mercy and about providence. God's providence is that the universe in which we dwell, if it's to be whole, has to be one in which injustices are responded to. But God's mercy is such that because we humans aren't capable of fixing the injustices that we cause, God will step in and as a fully human and fully divine person, Jesus the Christ will take the onus of fixing upon his own shoulders. That is a wonderful, wonderful message that ought to give hope to each and every one of us. And that, my friends, is the Easter message of resurrection and atonement. I'm Father Kerry Walters. Happy feast day to you. I will see you soon.